Many of you have, uh, the, the folks before me have said what, a, what an honor this is, and that's truly the case for me too. Uh, I, I won't go through all the, the special people who are here, but uh, you, you know that you mean an awful lot, and, and we're glad to have this dialogue with you today. What I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to uh, give, give some of the conceptual basis for conservation agriculture systems. I'm going to start off in a global sense, first of all, uh, what's going on in the world beyond California, and then we're going to come back for what some of the relevance of these kinds of systems could have in terms of principles and practices for California. Okay, first of all, we're talking about some new terminology right now. The term conservation, til or conservation ag itself has been demonstrated very broadly, very widely as a robust, sustainable, economically and environmentally sustainable set of principles and practices. That's number one. It is merging together the production, all right, the, the agronomy with the economics and the sustainability. All of these things are coming together there. And it's the integration of that ecological management with the business part of farming and with the, uh, the agronomy there. It is not, and let me be clear about this, this is not business as usual. All right? The concepts that, that underlie conservation ag are not just about making profit. There's more to it than that at the expense of the soil resource or other natural resources. It goes beyond that. It's about perhaps we might say optimizing yields but also looking at the sustainability dimensions of production systems. And the very last item on this, this particular slide, it makes the case that it may be more beneficial when you look at combining the economics, the sustainability, the ecology of systems, the combination of those orientations might be more useful than just the production alone. That's what we're talking about here. There are three fundamental principles of conservation agriculture systems, and they're shown here. As you move from conventional production over here toward conservation agriculture, you're first of all minimizing soil disturbance, a very deliberate intention to reduce the volume of soil that's disturbed. With that, you're also going to preserve and increase, generate and preserve surface residues. And also, by doing that, you enable yourself to have greater diversity, greater intensity of crop rotations. Those are the fundamental principles. And as you you move in these directions toward conservation agriculture, the presumption is that it's going to become more sustainable. In addition to those three principles, there are other sorts of practices that get bundled together in conservation ag systems, including integrated pest management. All right, as we've heard this morning, highly efficient uh, automated irrigation systems, particularly in a region like California here. Uh, and lastly, and, and this is something that, it, that is fairly new, I think, a uh, concept, CTF, Control Traffic Farming, uh, where you're minimizing the mechanical disturbance that, that the soils are, are facing here. What we're talking about here are truly systems, and we've heard that, that analogy or that, that, that idea brought up many times this morning. Starting off with conservation agriculture systems with residue management preserving, conserving residues, and then that allows you to diversify. Dan talked about saving water from these systems, allows you to intensify cropping systems, and then the other ecological processes that are part of farming, that are part of uh, agroecosystems come into play, and together they're all building integrated conservation ag systems here. A fundamental goal of conservation agriculture is improving the soil resource. All right, deepening that layer, that surface layer with time that is in an improved condition, all right, by, preserve, by reducing tillage and by reducing uh, or by preserving residues here. So that's a deliberate kind of a, a long term goal. Another thing I think that's important that in conservation agriculture recognizes this is that in the future there are going to be increasing demands, and, and, and all of us certainly realize this, for producing more in general with less minimal and uh, less damage to the the environment and that's probably i think as we're all well aware as well going to become an, an, a much more important uh, global imperative the term conservation agriculture in essence is linking production with sustainability 
it's not just uh, about the economics, the profit, it's also this other orientation here. Where is conservation ag pr uh, practiced around the world? All right, you can see here these, uh, these numbers here represent the millions of hectares that are used under conservation agriculture. The three leading areas are Central South America, Western Australia, and Canada that have the highest percentages of total acreage, total farmed acreage under conservation agriculture. All right. In Brazil, we're not talking small landholder primitive systems here. This is big scale stuff here. All right. Uh, automated and extremely efficient here. As I said, South America has pretty near about half of the world's acreage and conservation ag production systems right now with North America United States and Canada, uh, largely Canada, producing uh, over a quarter there. In Brazil, just the three countries of, uh, are in South America, just Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay themselves, uh, there are over 65% of acreage is now under conservation ag systems. In our country, it's about 25% under no-till. And the estimates are within the next 10 years in South America for that to increase to even 85%. So this is happening. It's, it's, it's being done. You look at the trends of adoption in these countries. All right, first of all, from Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, uh, Western Australia, and the United States for no-till, there's a certain inevitability, one would guess, from these kinds of data over the last 30 years. Our own uh, data in California that we track every two years are showing quite similar uh, patterns. Of, of these kinds of dis, uh, so reduced tillage uh, alternatives. Two points about the, the, the long-term history of conservation tillage are shown here. First of all, it started very early, back in the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s in the United States. But the actual accelerated increase of conservation agriculture around the world was very recent, in the last 15 or 20 years. There had been things that were going on in the interim, but the the, the spike, the peak, is, is coming right now in these systems. All right, last month I had an opportunity to be part of a, a national panel, and we were charged with the, the job of reviewing uh, a national research program for the USDA. It was the, one of their national programs, competitiveness and sustainability. It was a, a very rewarding experience for me personally. A couple things came out of my involvement on this panel. The first thing was that across the country, there is pretty much broad universality of recognition that these principles, these systems make sense. There's a lot of effort. There's a lot of uh, intention uh, put to what, what we're talking about today in, in this dialogue here. Number, that's the first thing. The second thing is that it's very important, and I think I've tried to make the case that conservation agriculture systems are looking toward the future. You have to take the long view. How would a given production practice be evaluated in 100 years, in 500 years? What would the landscape be for society, for, for the environment, with that kind of a time frame? So that long view is very important here. My own personal mentor, Dwayne Beck, at South Dakota State University, uh, somewhat provocatively and dramatically, calls this the agronomic and ecological equivalent of the moon race back in the 60s. Right, why is that? Well, they didn't achieve a successful landing by testing small incremental improvements in rocket design. They did it by having a specific goal and teams that were focused on developing the techniques that will be required to achieve that goal. So what we're trying to do with this institute is have a dialogue about what the long-term sustainability goals are. What are they and what, what can we agree on? Then how can we all work through research, from information sharing, to develop the alternatives that are going to help us achieve those goals? And that's what we're talking about today. There are already farmers. This is a guy up in Yolo County, Russ Lester, and there may be many people here who have already set their own goals, their own sustainability goals. His goal is to be energy self-sufficient by this year, to reduce these kinds of emissions at his farm. 
My mentor, Dwayne Beck, has his own, for their research farm in South Dakota, his own set of goals. Reduce carbon losses. Reduce nutrient leakage in systems. So it's zero. These are long-term goals that we hope to, to, to create this dialogue about achieving. Now, within this group here and beyond, what we're going to try to do, and you've heard these themes over and over this morning, is bring people together to work on these challenges. They're big, big issues. We have to ask big questions to do this and then conduct focused, future-looking research that will address those long-term goals. Provide training. That's another theme that a lot of us have talked about. And partner directly with the people who are in this room here, who are the real progressive pioneers at, at, at this. We need support. And that's part of the, the, the reason we're all here together about this uh, today, is to discuss these things. And we'll have an opportunity after lunch to do that. We hope that there'll be uh, agreement or some sort of consensus that the goals make sense. But we also look for constructive guidance and direction from, from our advisors, the, the folks we're working with here. Uh, and, and, and frankly, we're going to need your leads, your ideas for how do we find and access qualified prospective donors who will uh, enable us to, to build capacity in this effort. So the dialogue is very important. And I say that because it's, 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 been, what's, it's been what's brought us to this point today. We have now a white paper. All right, that could be like a fundraising initiative. Look at the people in those co the column there, the same people on both sides there, have been part of this process to bring us to date here. They volunteered their time. They're here today to do this, and they've been in the trenches to help get this thing going here. But we're going to need more help to do this. I talked about the dialogue. These are a couple of books that have been written about some Midwestern farmer groups there. And one of them is personally very important to me, and I would like nothing more in my career than to see that kind of dialogue take place with us here in the Valley. If you look on the website, the, the Practical Farmers of Iowa, PFI, it's a group that's actually affiliated. They have an office at Iowa State University, but it is the kind of farmer-to-farmer -farmer information sharing that we're talking about in, in our CASI Institute here that I think could be very valuable in this big, big sense here. So that's something I hope we can accomplish here. Additional information about these innovative conservation agriculture systems is available on the Conservation Agriculture Systems Innovation website.